Well, good morning and welcome to the worship service. As we find our seats, we're going to be standing and counting our blessings this morning. <clears throat> when upon life's billows you are tempest tossed, when you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one. And it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. Many blessings. Scars seem heavy, you are called to bear. Count your many blessings, will fly, and you will be singing as the days go by. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. So amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged, God is over all. Count your many blessings, angels will attend. Help and talk of giving to your journey's end. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. And while you're counting your blessings, would you turn to Mark's gospel, Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, and I just asked Gavino what he's going to speak on this morning, and he tells me from Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 22. So this is our time of the week to push reset and refocus on how great God is. Because I know some of you are a little disappointed, a little discouraged as after yesterday, but uh, everything's going to be all right. Okay, the more important things in life than what a lot of people think about. And this is one of them right here. Mark chapter 10, verse 17. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeling to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And it's a good question, by the way. Maybe you're asking that this morning. So here's the answer. And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, and that is God. Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. And then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up thy cross. And follow me. And he was sad at that saying and went away grieved because he had great possessions. Now, Father, we're just going to pause here at the beginning of this service and say thank you for all of your blessings in our lives. As we heard in Sunday school this morning, it would have been uh, very easy for any one of us to be born in communist China or along the Gaza Strip the part of the world where there's persecution, famine. But you've been so good to us, especially here in Northwest Ohio and particularly Hancock County. We just stand amazed at how well you've blessed us. And when you bless us like this, it's so easy to take those blessings for granted. But most of all, we wanna thank you for such a rich and wonderful salvation that you provide for us through your son, Jesus. 
And I pray for your servant who is among us this morning that he would make the gospel message very simple and very plain. So that if there's someone here this morning who, like I was at 17 years old, not sure that heaven is their home, that before they leave this place today, they can, among their many blessings, count the fact that they're now a member of the family of God. So come and do that great work by your Holy Spirit. Minister from within as we seek to minister from without. And do what only you can by your spirit today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. A lot going on, which is so, so cool. Uh, volunteers are still needed uh, for... Uh, Monday, and I'll get to that here in a minute. Wednesday night, we're going to go back to KYB, and then if you could turn me down just a hair on the volume, that'd be great because I'm too loud. I'm too loud, not the sound guy. KYB and adult Bible studies. I'll tell you, there's a great prayer group here. There is uh, folks that meet back in the back. We get a lot of community members that come to the back, so I'd encourage you to come to that as well. Saturday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m., the community Christmas clothing, toy, and gift giveaway. If you know a family in need, please let them know. Please pray for this outreach. Please ask if you can volunteer. Folks, sometimes just being there and, and showing a smile, that's really, I mean, you want to share the gospel and don't want to stand here or don't want to teach a Sunday school class or don't want to go evangelize on a corner, just show a smile and love, and that would be a great way. December 7th at 6 p.m., ladies' Christmas party. Join us for a night of fun. Sign up in the lobby. There's also a gift exchange for the kids, too. December 9th, 5.30 to 7 p.m., uh, teen Christmas party here at the church. Again, uh, December 9th at 5.30 to 7, teen Christmas party here at the church. And December 10th is the Christmas love offering for the uh, Kellogg's and the Weichmans. I want to get back to this uh, real quick. This has been on my heart uh, because I didn't want to go. I can tell you that right now. We're all busy. Uh, we talked about the Sabbath today and the kids. It ain't about me. It didn't for me. I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. I've, I've got Jesus in my heart. This is not about me. This ain't for mo most of you in here. It's a Monday night. We got Monday night football. It's a Monday. Everybody loves to go back to work on Monday. But can you imagine if somebody came and they saw a smile or knew they were loved or said, wow, this is different than what I ever thought Jesus was about because they just had somebody invite them and you were there. Maybe you don't do ornaments and maybe you don't do this or that. But it's something different. And Jesus is involved. And I would encourage you, invite a friend. Invite a family member that hasn't come. Haul a group of kids out there. And let them just enjoy the love of Christ. Take a step out. So that's the first challenge I have today. Second challenge is, and I talked to Pastor, and I haven't done this for a while, I wanted to share with you about the kids in high school Sunday school. Um, and I want you to bear with me here for a couple minutes. And if you got notes, go ahead and take notes. You guys would be so unbelievably humbled by the questions these kids ask and the way they're seeking God. And they're struggling just like you all are. This year, I asked the three seniors, and I do it every year, what do you want to talk about? And I gave them Luke, a little bit of explanation, Romans, and Acts. And they chose Luke. They said, we want to learn a little bit more about a personal relationship with Jesus. Cool. Jerry, I'm about like you. We've gotten through six chapters so far. We're not moving too far. We're We just started chapter six. But we've been jumping off on different tangents because I've got some grenade throwers. Let me give you some questions. Help me out here if this is what you want to, if you want to teach Sunday school. Uh, Mr. Essinger, yes. God is a jealous God. That is correct. In Psalms, it says his name is jealous. Jealousy is a sin, yes. Yes, that's true. Well, God doesn't sin. Rectify that for me. <laughs> How do you know you have a personal relationship with Jesus? Go. Can women be pastors? 
And if not, why? Go. What's the choices you have? And they'll talk all this time, all the time about you have a choice between self and God. Explain that to me. We talk about lordship. What do I need to do? What's it mean to be saved? Folks, that's the questions we get, and they're incredible. And the conversations, and they, they will be vulnerable. You know, my kids won't be vulnerable. They won't read scripture. They won't ask questions. I'm going to not challenge you, and I don't want you to quiz them. But how many adults or parents in here ever ask their kids, how's your faith life? And with a true meaning and not accept the answer, it's good. It's okay. It's fine. How many of them have you share with them the struggles that you're going through and how you get through it? How many of you are vulnerable to them and say, I struggle finding rest today too. I don't always lean into Jesus. I don't know how to share the gospel. How many of you are going to go Monday and not sure how to share the gospel? Here's where the note section comes in. And, Jay, and Jerry said, enjoy the journey. So that's what I'm going to try to do today and not take away Gaviano? Gavino's time. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Turn it over. And I, I'm going to give you two areas how to share the gospel. The first one is, I don't believe in God and I don't know how. Here's three questions that I've taught the kids to ask and always ask questions. Don't, if somebody comes up and says, you know what, there's contradictions in the gospel. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to get a cold sweat, say, I don't know the Bible well enough, and then you're going to go, uh, uh, don't do that. Show me where the contradiction is. But here's the three questions I would ask if somebody came up to you and said, I'm not sure I believe. You can't say read the Bible because they go, I don't believe the Bible. Ask them these three questions. How did we get here? Why are we here? And where do we go when we're done? And genuinely listen to the answers. And go with this. I'll listen to your account. But in my 51 years, I've never heard a better account than Jesus. I, tell me the story that you have. How did you get here? My, my daughter called me and said, Dad, I always pick out one person that I want to share the gospel with in my co-op or for the semester at college. And she says, Dad, it's my four-minute work. What do I do? And I tried to steer him, and I said, ask him those three questions. She called him back and said, Dad, I asked him the three questions. The first question, she said, how did we get here? He said, evolution. That's how we got here. And he wasn't strong arm and hammering her. He just said, that's, I mean, where we were born. Okay. Question number two, why are we here? Raise a family. Take care of my family. Protect and provide. That's what I say. Agreed. I'm here to protect and provide. I'm also here to share the gospel. Question number three, what happens when we're done? You know what he said? I don't know. He comes and visits her in the hospital when she was in the explosion. And they start talking about Jesus. Sharing the gospel. Well, what is the gospel? And can't we get along? I mean, we've got all these different churches, and I'm not going to get into doctrine here at all, but I want you to get down to foundational so it's easy for you. And I'll run through these quick because this is what we do with the kids so that we set a foundation that we are in agreement. And I need your participation. In the beginning, God. say it louder. In the beginning, God. everybody agree with that? Genesis 1-1. And the word was, was God and was with God. Who was that? Are we in agreement? God and Jesus, yes? And God created... Man, God created man. This is the gospel, folks. Run it through like this with somebody. God, Jesus, man, and man did what? Amen. We're all sinners. Everybody agree? Amen? Amen? So now we're all sinners, and this may happen tomorrow night. And they're saying, I don't know how to share the gospel. Here you go. God, Jesus, man, man sinned. Now we're, gonna, we're in trouble. Who came to save us for our sins? And he walked the earth for how long? 33 and a half years to share his message of love and grace and salvation. Everybody agree? Amen? Amen. We are all on the same page. Not that hard. God, Jesus, man, sin, Jesus came. Amen? 
Now Jesus had to do something for us, and what did he do? He died on a cross. He took the sins for us, and, and he died on a cross. What happened next? He rose from the dead. Basis of our faith. We don't have the resurrection. Basis of our faith. He rose from the dead. This is what we go through in high school Sunday school. He rose from the dead, and now he's raised from the dead. You have your faith, and then what happens? That's coming. He gave us our marching orders, 40 days. Because everybody said he ascended. He gave us our marching orders, 40 days, Matthew 28, the end of Luke, the end of John. The end of, he said, go and share me. Share my Father's love. Share the grace and salvation. That's what you're going to do tomorrow night. And I know this is awkward because I'm not a preacher. And you're right, I'm not a preacher. I'm not, I'm not uh, educated. Uh, I'm just sharing you because you're going to share the gospel through your love, through your smiles, through this message. God, Jesus, created man. He sinned, created in his image. Jesus came to earth, told us how to be saved. Died on a cross for us to show us the greatest love ever given. Rose from the dead to show he conquered death. Gave us our marching orders. Ascended to heaven. And then, Jay, what are you going to do? Oh, what hope do you have? And yet we'll argue amongst each other. You have to do this or you have to. Listen, that's the gospel. And you get to share it. So when you get those tough questions. saving grace you could ever have. So what I'm going to ask you to ask these kids, maybe, I don't know these high school kids, and they've been forewarned. And they said, well, they'll quiz me. No, sit down with them. What's your faith life like? What do you know? Are you struggling to rest? So am I. What's your gospel look like? And you'll be amazed at the answer you'll get because they'll encourage you when you thought you were going to help them out. And Jesus will move on. I encourage you to sit down with them. I encourage you to listen to the message today because I love the passage. Why do you call me good? There's no one good but God. That's not what gets you to heaven, Jesus does. Thank you for your time. Make sure you ask those kids, and I'll see you all tomorrow night. Please stand as we sing our praise and worship songs together.
Thank you. Please be seated. And, uh, I had a couple of desserts, just to be frank with you, and uh, I thought, you know what, it'd be wonderful if our folks back home could. Thank you, Chris. Amen. Thank you. All right, well, good morning. Amen. We're excited to be here. Um, it's roughly been about a year since we were here last. We came, I think it was December 5th of last year. We were here roughly around the same time we were doing our Bethlehem experience up at Cornerstone. Um, and so I'm just so grateful again, preacher, for having us in. Um, this has definitely been a church that's been close to our hearts. Um, we've, we've, we've enjoyed, um, I would say, the fellowships and several occasions. We've already had two couples with the Cornerstone Church and the church here that have gotten married. It's Andrew Hunter and Gabriella and now um, Caitlin and Josh. And we're so excited um, just to uh, just to ha have people and, f and fellow brethren that are on the same page and they're moving forward trying to present the gospel and trying to reach the world with Christ. We need more people that are doing that. And I'm just so grateful for you guys to still just being at with it and just kind of moving forward and taking the gospel. And I'm excited what's going on with Ghost Town. And it's a great opportunity. If you guys can get out there and serve in that, please do so. Um, and whatever you guys have going on here on, um, with, uh, with outreach, I'd just say jump in. There's nothing like seeing somebody get saved and you having a part in it and sharing the gospel. Having, break it down this way. Having a destiny being changed from somebody on their way to hell and now being on the way to heaven and you had a part and, and, and sharing the gospel. What, 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 what an amazing blessing. You know, God could have used angels. He could have, you know, the Bible even says that even the rocks could cry out. But the thing is that he wants to use you in particular. What a blessing. And just to think about it that way. Um, I would just encourage you, let's, let's open up our Bibles. By, uh, um, I believe it was Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. Um, uh, we've already read the passage um, I do want to give you just a quick update real quick before we move any farther. Um, this is my lovely wife, Mariana, if you'd stand up real, real quick. You know, I married up, and she's, way my, she's my better half for sure. Um, and so we're going on nine years of marriage tomorrow, and um, I don't know... I uh, mean, I, 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 I tell people, I, I don't know why, one, she even chose me in the beginning. But I'm definitely her mission field, but it's definitely a blessing. Um, thank you. you. May be seated. And we have two daughters, Naya and Aaliyah. Naya is eight years old, and Aaliyah is six right now. They're with my mother um, in Fostoria. They're at their church over there. Um, every time we're home, uh, we always try to, you know, us to get back to our church and us just to kind of sleep in our bed and they get to see grandma and stuff like that. We've been in 87 churches roughly so far since in the past 14 months. We're about 65%, 65 to 67% right now with our needed support. You guys are one of our supporting churches. Um, so we're very, very excited in order just to kind of come back and give you an update on where we're at. Lord willing, by June or July of next year, we'll be on our way down there. We still would have to still work on some paperwork and stuff like that. So depending on paperwork, they'll kind of allow us to see where we're re when we're really going to be able to get down there. But our target date is right now is in June or July. So I thank you for your prayers so far. I'm an open book. Come and talk to me. Ask me questions. If you want to ask me what my favorite food is, feel free. I love street tacos. If you want to talk about tacos, we can talk about tacos all day. Uh, but um, just, you know, I, I know several of you here, but please just come up and talk to me. If you want to get to know us, please feel free. I'm not, I'm, I'm just a very down-to-earth guy, so please just talk to me.
All right. Talk to my wife. Um, I know the women. I've had a couple women come up to me and tell me that it was a blessing to hear my wife's testimony this morning inside the, the, the Women's Sunday School. And my wife has a tremendous testimony. I'm just so grateful for that. But Mark chapter 10, Mark chapter 10. We've already read through the passage, but one thing I want to point out is verse 21, and that's where we're going to get the title of the message from. Verse 21, Mark chapter 10, and it says, and Jesus beholding him, loved him. Now, we all know how this story plays out because we already read this passage, but it's very, it's very heartbreaking for me where it said, Jesus loved him. Because Jesus knew his response. There's the foreknowledge of God and Jesus being God. He knew what this response of this young rich ruler was going to be. But Jesus points out, it basically said, it, the Bible points out that Jesus loved him. He showed a, a side of compassion knowing how this gentleman was going to respond. And he said, he loved him. And he said, and said unto him, one thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast to give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasures in heaven, and come and take up thy cross and follow me. Now, I understand very clearly before we get any farther into this, I understand that this context is talking about salvation. Because what I'm going to go is I'm going to bring it from a different perspective. And yes, we are going to talk about salvation, but I also want to have a Christian application into this. Because I believe that there's a very, there's, there's a very heavy um, biblical principle here that as Christians sometimes we overlook. And some, if you're not saved today, I believe that this is a very good, clear presentation of the gospel that you have to do it God's way, not your own way. And I would just like to present that to you this morning. I really do desire from the bottom of my heart that it would not be my words nor my thoughts that are presented today, but the Bible that's presented in God's thoughts and God's word. But the topic or the, to the, the subject of the, to this morning would be one thing that thou lackest. And I would just really encourage you to please ponder on that phrase there. There's one thing that thou lackest. And with that being said, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and so grateful for your amazing blessings and mercy upon our lives, God. As we come out of uh, the Thanksgiving uh, holiday, Father God, it's, it's, uh, it's good for us to make memories and to spend time with family, God, but I just ask right now that we would always maintain and focus uh, the reason why we're giving thanks, and it's giving thanks to you and what you have given to us. God, I come to you right now and just ask and beg that you would please be our guest of honor this morning as we um, read through your word and uh, present uh, just biblical truth. Father, I ask that I would be out of the way, that I would be not the one that's preaching, but your Holy Spirit and God, I ask right now that you would just please talk to my heart. Show me where I need to be uh, corrected and, and what the things that I need to get fixed in my life, Father God. And also that you would just talk to hearts here in this church. Father God, we thank you for the testimony of this church. We thank you for the people that are here present this morning. We know that you have a divine plan for it. And we ask now, God, that you would just work in a mighty way. Be with us. Be with my words, be with what's presented, and we ask that you would take full honor and full glory of what is done this morning. We ask all this in your precious holy name. Amen. Amen. Now, if you've been in church any length of time, you have known for, or you've, you've heard a message, or you've known of this story, the young rich ruler that has come to Jesus Christ. The Lord, uh, the Bible calls him rich because he was very wealthy. And if you look, I believe it's in verse 22 where, where he says, oh, he leaves sad because he was, he, because Jesus Christ knew that he had, he was very wealthy and he didn't want to give up all of his riches. Now, we love to talk about these stories when it comes down to giving it to kids. And uh, I, for, for, uh, for about five years, I gave junior church. So I've looked at Bible you know, I, I, in, in a very, I would say, um, in a very 
simple way. I've, I've had to break down the meat, cut up the meat in order to be able to get it through, to give it to first through sixth graders. And uh, it's very crazy when you start breaking down the Bible in a very simple way. It's just, it's just, it, it's crazy on how profound and how deep these things are. The thing is, is that God makes things very simple. I personally believe, this is my opinion, that we complicate it. Salvation is very simple. Salvation is, we have an issue of sin. Who's going to pay for the sins? That's your decision. That could be you in eternity in hell, or that could be Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that he's done for you. That's your decision to make. But God cannot let sin enter into heaven, period. That's the gospel. That's literally salvation in a nutshell. Sanctification is walking along with Jesus Christ, letting God guide you and you becoming more closer to God and becoming more like God, having it rub off on you, responding back and not in a humanistic way, but in a spiritual way, not letting your flesh overtake your spirit, which is a continual battle. A lot of these things are very, very, very simple, but the thing is that we overcomplicate them sometimes. I would encourage you, just have the faith of a child because Jesus Christ clearly said that theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Thing is, is that a, a child accepts the things on how you tell them it is, right? Don't touch that, that's hot. Ooh, hot. What's hot? They might not know what hot is, but they understand it's dangerous. They may experience what hot is sometime. My mom pulled out a piece of toast and put it on my hand after it came out of the toaster. Oh, that's hot. Now, I don't want something hotter than that when I touch the stove. Things like that. It's very, very basic that we can break it down and we can all try to get fed like these things. Sometimes we want to go to the extreme hardcore theology. and That's fine. If you want to get into that, that's, that's good. And I would encourage you to get into that. But a lot of the stuff is on the bottom shelf for us to reach. And I believe that's where we're at here in this, in this story. This is where we come in and we see this young rich ruler that uh, is, is coming to Jesus. And he's, he's, he's uh, coming in and trying to present to Jesus what... He's done in his lifetime. Now you can find that this story is found several in several occasions throughout the Gospels and in uh, Matthew chapter 19 and here in Mark 10 and Luke 18. There are small differences in the description, but it's all the same story and it all comes down to the same result. But you have to understand the difference between the, the perspective of Matthew, the perspective of Luke, and the perspective of Mark, and what the whole context of that book is, which that's a topic for another day. But we have to look at this right here. And I wanted to pick out Mark because this, this, this in particular. I truly believe, if you look in verse 13, it says, And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running, uh, uh, running and knelt, and, and knelt, uh, kneeled, sorry, kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Now, that's why I said earlier, I understand that this is talking about salvation. And I do not want to grab this out of context. But I believe the application is still the same when it comes down to our personal walk as Christians, and when it comes down to our, uh, our uh, basically in need of salvation. When I look at this, this story, I, I see a man that's running towards Jesus, knowing who Jesus was. If you didn't know who that person was, you're definitely not making your, going out of your way in order to run towards somebody, kneel before them, and call them good master. So I truly believe, as looking at this young rich ruler, that he understood that there was something different about Jesus and that either he was a prophet or that he was the Messiah, but he knew he had a very high position that he could get a direct answer for a spiritual um, issue. So he comes up and he kneels before Jesus and he says, Good master, what do I need to do in order to inherit eternal life? 
Now, this is where it starts kind of, I start seeing myself here. Is that this man reverenced Jesus. Because I believe that he knew that Jesus was the Messiah. He ran to him. He knelt down before him. He called him good master. Now, the response is, uh, in verse 18, it says, And Jesus said, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one that is God, which reassures my perspective of this because Jesus Christ says, Why in the world are you calling me good if God is the only one that's good? And we never see this guy respond back, well, oh, well, you, you may be the prophet. Oh, you, no, I believe that he exactly knew who Jesus was. And so Jesus wants to have a one-on-one -on -one connection with this young man and he, as he knelt down before Jesus. But this is where I think it starts going sideways. Is that in verse 20, it says, And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these things have I observed from my youth. Because Jesus starts saying, Well, you need to keep the commandments. I'm my father and my mother. Don't steal. All this different stuff. He starts pointing that out. And the response of this young rich ruler is, I've done all of that. Okay? Now, this is where I was looking at it. And I'm like, this guy wanted a pat on the back from Jesus Christ on his spiritual state. He wanted to approach Jesus Christ and say, you know what? Everything that you required me to do, I've done it. You asked me to go ahead and it, let's just use it in our terms right now. You asked me to give my tithing. I give my tithing. You asked me to go out and pass out tracts. I go out and I pass out tracts. You go out and ask me to, to, uh, to you know, do certain standards or whatever, and I've done everything that you asked me to do. I've honored my father, and I've honored my mother. I've done everything. Religiously speaking, I've done everything that you have, have told me to do. And it's very crazy because when we start looking at these things, it's very easy for us to have really, uh, to, to, to find ourselves here too. He was trying to show Jesus all the good works that he had done, or that he has done, and and I believe Christians have gotten to that point of where, as us, we have gotten to that point where, God, you've asked me to do everything you've asked me to do. I've done it. You asked me to give to the church. I've given to the church. You asked me to go out and evangelize. I've done that. You, know, you asked me to you know, uh, just read my Bible. I do that every day. I've done and checked off every little box that you have told me to do religiously. I don't cuss. I don't watch pornography. I don't beat my wife. I go to church every Sunday. I do what you have me to do, and I'm a good Christian. And I believe that's the same approach that this young rich ruler was trying to do when he approached Jesus Christ. To have that, hey, you've done everything. Good job. And as, as I was studying this, I'm like, wow, we. If there's any description of what religion is versus relationship, that's clearly here in this, in, 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 in this, in this story. Because you can have, this, this is a profound statement that my pastor said, you can have relate. Uh, uh, what, you can have religion without love, but you can't have true love without religion. And I say that in the aspect of you can serve God your, to, to your blue in the face and you can do it without loving him. But you cannot truly love God and not truly serve him. It's, it's really crazy because I believe we all have gotten to that point that we can just do everything to check off that, that, that I'm good. I'm good. I've done everything right, box. I am perfectly good religiously before my God, and he can't point anything out to me where I'm wrong. And we just want to come even into church and you get that pat on the back 
whether that be from God or whether that be from a pastor. We just want to get that extra acknowledgement of you're on the right path. You're doing good. You know, and this is where I, I look at this, is that Jesus didn't focus on what the man had, but what the man lacked. He didn't say, oh, yeah, you have. Yes, you did good, do a good job on obeying your parents and, 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 not, you know, and, and not committing adultery and not stealing or bearing false witness. You did all those things very good. No, he said there's one thing that you lack. He wanted to point out that you're not all there yet. And you won't be all there yet while you're still here in this flesh. Sorry. This is my true belief is that if you have if you think that you have grown all the way that you need to grow spiritually, then you're not growing at all. If you think that you are very fully mature spiritually, then you're probably very immature. Because it's a continual battle, daily battle that happens between the flesh and the spirit. And while you're still in the flesh, that flesh will still entice you in order to do the sweet sin that your body desires to do. But your spirit has to realize that your body, your flesh, is dead to the spirit. It's a continual battle that we need to focus on. Because the moment that you ha are no longer focused on having the spirit take over, then you're more than likely giving way to the flesh. There is always going to be that one thing that you have that you don't have right. And guess what? It's okay. But with the moment that you feel like you got everything right is when you're out of balance. When you get to the point that you realize I'm missing in several different areas as a Christian, then you realize that you still need of God. But when you get to the point where you think that you have everything right and everything's good and you want that extra pat on the back, then you're off balance because who just became God in your life? God should not be the crutch that we sustain our life on. He should be everything that sustains us while we live. It should be our full, full existence should be based on God. Not just something that we lean on whenever we desire. And I believe we struggle with that very, very hard. You know, if you're, you're human and you're not perfect... And you have to understand that if you're, if you're saved, you have to understand that you're going to be struggling with things and God's going to point things out to you in your life and saying, hey, guess what? You don't have all your ducks in the row. You may need to work on this. But the thing is, is that it's not for you to turn your back on that and say, you know what? I'm never going to have everything right. Just chuck it to the wind and keep on moving. That's not what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be working on these things and moving forward and saying, God, show me if there's something in my life that needs to be removed. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me, know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me. But the thing is, is that we're too scared because we know personally already where we struggle. And we know if that sin or if that particular thing gets touched on, we know that we're going to fall vulnerable. We're not going to get that pat on the back and, <gasps> guess what? It's okay. Work on it. Ask God to give you grace. Ask God for help. You need him. You can't do this all alone. He is God. He's not just your best friend that's just rubbing you shoulders with you. He 
is everything that you need. We need to get to the point where we truly, truly, truly realize that God is what we need. Now, the things that we may be lacking in our lives and just by this, this context is, is just deliverance, salvation. We may be just lacking in the salvation area. When Jesus Christ is pointing this thing out to this young rich ruler, it's because this young rich ruler was saying, guess what? I've kept all the commandments, and guess what? I think I deserve eternal life. So I want the extra pat on the back in order for you to co-sign me to say I can have that. And Jesus Christ said, no, you're not going to do that. Let's put that into the context nowadays. How many people say, you know, oh, I give to the poor. Oh, I go to church. Oh, I'm a good person. Oh, guess what? I don't do this. I don't do that. And I should be good enough to when, when I get up to heaven, the scales are put out before me, and God's going to weigh out my good things and my bad things. Okay? You can be the most upright citizen in the whole entire world and pay your taxes, serve the community, and just with 10 seconds of rage, go out and kill somebody. And guess what? For the rest of your life, you're a murderer. How in the world is the judge of judges going to say, oh, you know, you've done all this good in your life, but this one little thing, eh, it's not going to outweigh. Your bad is always going to outweigh your good. I'm sorry. That's just the reality of it. And the thing is, is that your sins outweigh all your good works, no matter how heavy your good works are. The only thing that can outweigh your sins is the blood of Jesus Christ, period. And that's the way that he said that it has to go. And it's not by what you think that you could do it. Because here's the whole point of all of this that I'm getting down to. Is that spirituality is not how you think it is. It's how he says it is. It's not for you to approach, this is my spirituality. God, give me a tap on the back and everything's good. I'm good to go. No, that's not how it works. Either you come in through the way that he says as it's described in, in John chapter 10. If not, you jump off of the wall, then you're a thief and a robber. But the thing is, is that you have to understand that it's only one way in order to get to heaven. Not your way. It's God's way. Because he is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by him. So whether you try to do it by paying your way to heaven, you're not going to get there. Whether you try to do it by your religious way, guess what? It's not sufficient. Whether you think you're going to do it just by going to church every single Sunday and singing and doing it, it's great. That's, all these things are good things, and I'm not trying to put them down. But it doesn't mean anything if there is no salvation. You have to do it his way in the right way in order for it to be validated. And that's what Jesus Christ was trying to point out here. Yes, you've done everything. Good. But they're still lacking something. And that's to do it my way. The way I've said to do it. And the way I'm going to tell you how to do it right now, go sell all your possessions. Because he wanted a bit of sacrifice from this young man and that was too hard for him. So, one, maybe salvation another part might be submission to God giving God complete control of your life you know as we go through our lives it's very easy for us sometimes to think that we are on the steering wheel and that we're taking control over everything and you know what there's a lot of sins that are provoked because of that and Yes, we may make some good decisions, but isn't it a lot easier just to say, God, I just want to follow you. I want to grab you by the hand and just follow you wherever you want to go. My life is your life. My service that I have to do is not for my own benefit and for my flesh. It's for the benefit of the cause of Jesus Christ. It's to honor and glorify my God and Savior. Being totally submitted is that one place that we lack. There's another place that we lack in the security of God's arms or just having faith. I believe we struggle a lot, but the thing is that you had to have enough faith in order to get saved. You had to have enough faith that God was not going to change his mind on you. 
you had to have enough faith that when you do get to heaven that he's not going to say, well, that prayer, you didn't say the actual right words, so guess what? You're going to the lake of fire. Your, lay, your faith is very profound there. Then what is, where do, why do we struggle in faith when God wants to maybe call our family member, our children, or whatever into the mission field? Or call them into full-time service and we don't have complete control over that. And God, what are you doing? Ah, oh, you get scared. Do we have enough faith that God knows what he's doing in the way this direction of this country is going? I know that's a very touchy subject, but guess what? If you, if you study out Romans 13, it's ordained by God. Do we need to get to a place as a country that we need to remember that God, the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Father is the God of this country? Does he have to put us through the ringer sometimes in order for us to remember that we need to humble ourselves before God? Our answer is not in Washington, I'm sorry to say that. Our answer is in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not in the police force, even though we should be supporting our police force. We should be praying for our president. We should be supporting our military and praying for our military. But those aren't our answers. The answer is with what you have in your hand, is the Bible. I, I broke this down recently. Do you really understand that if we were out sharing the gospel and winning people to Christ, that we wouldn't need as much police force and as much military as what we have right now? Maybe a lot of the chaos that we have is self-inflicted because we just want to stay in our own little bubble and not do anything about it. Oh, I'm too scared that they're going to throw something at me or tell me to leave the house or not talk to me anymore. Well, here's this, is that if you go out and you study the, 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 the parable of the sower, the sower is just responsible of sowing the seed. He's not responsible of what, where the ground it falls on. That's the Holy Spirit's job. He's just out sharing the gospel. But we should be there in order to water and to do certain things. To harvest, to reap, but we're supposed to be out sowing, sharing the gospel. Another place that we may be struggling with or one thing that we lack is sanctification and identification with God. Sanctification, just identifying with God. You know, I've, I've heard, unfortunately, several times throughout I, you know, the ministry that the Lord's allowed me to have is people getting saved and going to a church and finding out that their coworker worked there and they didn't even know that that person was a Christian for 20 years. Sanctification in understanding that you are an image of God with the people around you. In the aspect of you're sharing what God has done through you and you're sharing it with them. Sanctification is moving closer to God, trying to rub shoulders with Him and saying, God, rub, rub some of your, 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 your spiritual sense off on me so I can, I can not give way to my flesh, but give way to the Spirit. Do we struggle in that area of truly identifying with God, or do we try to hold ourselves back and say, you know what? I don't know if they want to they know that I'm a Christian. Because of the way that we talk or the way that we act or the way that we do certain things. I understand. Going back to this, we're all flesh. But the thing is, is that don't ever get to the point where, ah, I got this. I'm good to go. God, I'm just here, so yeah. Give me a pat on the back. Send me out. I got, I got God's approval. Because then I'd point out, well, you may have an ego issue. There's always going to be that one extra thing that that lackest. But the response should be, okay, God, then help me with it. You know what, God, I, I don't want to do it my way. I'm not here just for an approval. I'm here to grow. 
I'm here to be closer to you in order to be useful for you. And we need to truly be getting closer to the Lord. Jesus challenges this man in verse 21. It says, then Jesus beholding him, uh, beholding him, loved him. Jesus wanted to show a little bit of grace to him, having him already showing his reaction to, to God, to Jesus, and, and, and saying, you know what, I have everything down. I have it down pat. And Jesus said, whoa, 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 whoa. Hey, let me, let me show you something. Let me show you in a, a little teaching manner. Let me love on you a little bit. Praise God that not all the admonishment or all the instruction that God shows us in our lives is through a tragic accident or through something very difficult. That it can be in a church setting where he pricks our heart and says, hey, you're dealing with this. And you're able to come to the altar or talk to your pastor and deal with it. Because there's that little extra love that's placed on there that doesn't come with some type of judgment or some type of reprimand. Aren't you grateful for that? And it says, and he said unto him, one thing thou lackest, go thy way and sell whatsoever thou hast and give to the poor and thou shalt have treasures in heaven and come, take up thy cross and follow me. See what Jesus Christ was, I believe was pointing out is that, hey man, guess what? Yes, you may have all those different things, but one thing that you lack is giving up of yourself and sacrificing of yourself and putting other people first. And to be a real true Christian, you have to put people first. Because that's a reflection of Jesus Christ. He laid down his life without opening up his mouth. And he did that because he loved you so much. So to be a reflection of Jesus is, yes. But they're going to walk all over me. Do it in love. Understand that they're going to spend eternity somewhere. And he gives them that little extra, hey, but this is one thing you're, work, you're struggling with. Do it. I want to show you that you fall short. That's where, really, truly what I believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is doing. You don't have all the answers. And you're not doing it my way. So Jesus Christ was trying to pull off something that was materialistic because this guy was very materialistic. And he wanted to point out, guess what? You struggle with this. Boom. Now tell me if you're spiritual. Because this man was trying to do it his way. And when you try to do it your way, you're always going to slam your face up, unfortunately, against the wall because God is perfect and you're not. Neither am I. But when you come humbly, it's a different thing. So, just to conclude, whether it be when it comes down to salvation, submission, control, security in God's arms, sanctification, whatever it may be, the things have to be done God's way. Because you're always going to come up short. And it's very clear because if you go back to Romans, let me just point this out to you real quick. Romans 6.23, it says, it says, For the wages of sin is death, which we all have sinned, right? But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, let's go back. Very similar passage to this one. Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Sin is the issue. You have come short. The only way to get through that is to come through Jesus Christ, through that gift, which is a sacrifice that was given for you on Calvary. But it's your decision whether you want to pay for eternity for your sins or let Jesus Christ do it. And Christian, when it comes down to you, 
We need to understand that we will come up short in the glory of God. You don't have it all done because you still have a sinful body. Your, spirit, your, your soul is redeemed. Your spirit's redeemed. But the thing is, is that you have to get to the point where you understand you're going to have a battle. But what are we doing with those battles? Are we using it for growth or are we using it for us to get discouraged and to walk away? Are we, get, are we doing it for us to get, become, come before Christ or come before the church and to get the extra pat on the back and say, oh, well done, you've done great. You know when we're going to hear well done? Is when we get to heaven and he's going to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. But that's not because of you. It's because of Jesus Christ. And well done, you've chosen well. Enter. Can you imagine that? But I want us to really understand this morning that there is one thing that thou lackest. Don't ever get to the point where you just, I'm good to go. With every head bowed, every eye closed, I'm going to pass it off to Pastor. All right, so there's one thing, one thing thou lackest. And if you're here this morning without the Lord Jesus Christ, that's the one thing. And there is a vast gulf that separates you from him, and that gulf is called sin. And you can try a variety of different ways to get to the other side, but they all come short. But God in love looked down on the situation and knew it from eternity past, and he in love sent his only begotten son. The word begotten means there will never be another. Is your one and only opportunity, your one and only chance. And he came and he bridged that gap from sin to heaven. And if you're willing to repent of your sin, which means to turn directions and come running to Jesus and accept his free gift of eternal life, he will save you. And put his life inside of you. Because he died for you. He was buried and he rose again. That he might live his life in you and through you. If you've never done that. That may be the reason why God allowed you to come to this service this morning. And we're going to sing a hymn of invitation. Which means I'm going to be standing down here at the front. We're going to sing an old hymn entitled. Great is thy faithfulness. If God has touched your heart in a special way, I'm going to encourage you to step out to the nearest aisle and just come and take me by the hand and say, Pastor Kellogg, would you please show me from God's word how I can know for sure that heaven is my home. And we'll be glad to take as long as necessary to do just that. Father, thank you for this uh, true account that happens in Matthew, Mark, and Luke's gospel, and each one of those uh, presented in just a slightly different form. But Mark's gospel goes out of its way to tell us that you looked at him and you loved him. Just as you're looking at that lost soul here in this auditorium this morning, help them to be willing to turn from their sin of rejecting Christ and reach out and receive the free gift of eternal life so that they can call you Lord and Savior when they leave this place today. Do that great work from within. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together. We're going to sing, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Great is Thy Faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of
just stay standing. This should take just a second, Lord willing. First of all, a couple of announcements. As you heard, tomorrow night is big at uh, 5 to 7 o'clock, and as Brian emphasized, don't just come to come, but come to give, okay? Come to be a blessing. Come to reach out and ask God before you leave your home. God, make me a blessing to whoever I meet along the journey and help me to be prepared to share the gospel as we heard this morning. Secondly, choir members, you're probably already aware of this, but right after the service, we're having choir practice, so um, that's uh, available for you too. Uh, I'm so glad we have a couple of families coming to join our church this morning, and uh, Gavino, I have to have you come back because when you preach, people join our church, I don't know. <laughs> So we're glad for that. Uh, first of all, so thankful for Ryan and Alex McDowell. And uh, it's been a privilege for me personally to get to know them and to see their heart. And they're coming this morning to join in membership here at our church. I need someone to make a motion that we have them as a member. Okay. Um, yes, I see Sean. I'm trying to think of your name, Sean. Sorry. Sean Griggs uh, makes the motion. And my friend Brian Essinger has already raised his hand to second the motion. All in favor, would you raise your hand, your right hand? I know. I threw a little curveball at you, didn't I? And baseball season's over. And uh, all who um, are not in favor, would you raise your right hand? Okay. That's unanimous. So I'm going to ask that you all stand at the back there after the service and people get to greet you. I want you to stand back there too, okay, so we can pat you on the back. <laughs> and then we have the John Russell family, and what a blessing John has been. He's pretty good with a chainsaw, by the way, so watch out for his chainsaw. And Chris with a K, is that right, Chris? And then Caden, who's the... the outstanding basketball player down here okay so they're coming to join in membership with us at our church this morning I need someone to make the motion and Wesley we would let, we would accept yours but you have to be a member first okay we love you Wesley maybe one day Jay Fromer and then I, uh, I see uh, 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 my good friend <laughs> Andy Stewart you still my good friend Andy <laughs> I've eaten way too much turkey please forgive me okay I think it affects my brain but all in favor, would you raise your right hand? And then all who oppose, would you raise your right hand? Okay, and again, that looks pretty unanimous to me. So we're very grateful, and we would like to have you all stand at the door so people can okay. greet you. I'll let you guys go now. And I'm going to pray for us, and uh, hope you'll have a good rest of the day. Hope to see you tomorrow night up at uh, the ghost town. Father, thank you so much for your word to us this morning. And again, I want to thank you for this uh, 
wonderful passage in Mark's gospel, how you emphasized there that uh, you loved a very uh, confused individual. It sounds like a lot of people today who have a lot of material possessions and even a lot of good works to go with them. And they sometimes think that because of their possessions uh, and their wealth and their religion, they get to go to heaven. But as we've heard, there's one thing that he was lacking, and that was his, uh, his need to repent of sin and put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ and him alone. So we praise you how simple you've made it. Again, I pray for that one who may be leaving here this morning without ever having done that. Work in their heart and life privately to continue to draw them by your Holy Spirit. We rejoice, Father, with uh, the way you're bringing in uh, new families into our church, and we rejoice with the Russells, and they're coming to be a part of the ministry here. We pray your richest blessing over them, that as they come in, that uh, we could uh, just um, work together to see Christ being ever exalted and glorified in, in this little community of Arlington. Also, we thank you for the McDowells, and so thankful for what you're doing in and through their lives. Please continue to richly bless them as well. Make us all a blessing this afternoon to others we'll meet along the journey, and then tomorrow night, may you make that a great experience for our church as well. We love you and ask this from you in Jesus' precious name. Amen.